Hello everyone, and welcome to my legendary starter guide for the Skaven. The Skaven are a particularly quite fascinating faction in the fact that you have to worry about three things for your campaigns. You have to worry about food, you have to worry about gold, and you have to worry about public order. The Skaven in general are a very difficult faction. Judging by the global achievements, it's the hardest faction to beat on very hard and legendary difficulty. But here's the here's the real kicker. The thing is, with the Skaven, since you're relying so much on food, there's not many places you can actually produce food at in Lustra. There are three great pastures, and only two of them that are located close to your home province. So the main source of food is through destroying enemy stacks or enemy armies, and on almost on a turn turn by turn basis. So, what that effectively means is that if the lower the difficulty you play on for the Skaven, the harder the campaign gets. But, if you play on very hard or legendary difficulty, you'll be fighting armies non-stop, and with, through that method, you can obtain food to keep expanding your empire. Now, can you go for a world domination with the Skaven? Unfortunately, it's I, I wouldn't really suggest it. I would just focus on the Eye of the Vortex victory. And you can definitely beat the campaign by creating like a meat shield around your empire. And then slowly withdrawing your troops back to deal with the Eye of the Vortex. And that's what this kit, this uh, starter guide will focus primarily on. Well, I'll also be going over a couple strategies for both the, begin the beginning section and for late game. Now, in regards to the Skaven, I would strongly suggest choosing Clan Pestilent. Clan Moors and Clan Pestilent, Clan Moors focuses more on its general infantry, which in general for legendary difficulty is just not that good. You really need to sp like focus on more specialized units that the Skaven have and utilize them to the most as you can. The Plague Monks have Frenzy attacks, have very powerful DPS, but they don't have a lot of armor. The Plague Claw Catapults is a special artillery piece, which the Skaven have, which is quite possibly the strongest artillery piece in the game. Due to the fact that its default... It, artillery pieces already do a default of minus 10 leadership when they hit a target. With the debuff extra bonus ability that the Plague Claw has, it does a Plague ability which does another minus 10 leadership. So that's minus 20 leadership on hitting an enemy. That's huge. A lower difficulty is you should see an impact right away. Maybe even route a certain unit. But on legendary difficulty, having this artillery piece will greatly help you in the early game, mid game, and late game. Overall, my personal suggestion would be to focus Clan Pestilent in utilizing its artillery throughout the campaign. As for its other units, the Plague Monks and the Plague Sensor Bearers, those are essentially your heavy advanced infantry. But of course, we'll be doing a mix and match between different units and such. And through that, we will start the campaign. When you first spawn into the Lustria Island, you're essentially at a major disadvantage between the, the Southern Sentinels. There's a Southern Sentinel tribe to your west and the Southern tr Sentinel tribe to your southeast. You have to make precise movements to actually get into the right position. There's no reason for you to, to occupy that ruin to the southeast and you'll essentially have to be planning ahead to move up. You have your dwarfs to the southwest and the Itza lizardmen to the north. Do not expand to the north if you can help it. Essentially what you have to do is secure this corner down here to build up your economics and to secure that you don't get backstabbed by the high elves in the high dusk area to the far southeast corner. Effectively what you'll be doing is expanding your, your empire to the southeast here. If you are going to choose a beginner building, my strong suggestion would be to choose the public order building right off the bat. Some people might think like, oh, getting the extra food early game is good, 
But at this stage of the game, what's more important is to control the public order on legendary difficulty or on very hard. That's the suggestion why I suggest getting the uh, the public order building up and going. Later on, once we have stabilized the region much more, we can go ahead and give ourselves a bit more food. Now, in this big section right here, you're going to move your army westward and spot the enemy army and then click on them and see how far they can reach you. You gotta double check whether or not they can get reach you and when you have that small gap, the enemy army will not reach you. Now why are we doing this action? The thing is we're trying to get as far away from that ruin as possible. Because what it's gonna do, the AI is gonna think, oh wait, I can occupy this city, this ruin, without the risk of being attacked by the enemy. Because if you put your army in that spot on the border right there and you produce some soldiers, they're not going to take over the, the ruined settlement. So essentially you're up against, well, two bad fronts. You have the Lizardman army that's bigger than your army to your west, and occupying the east will just result in you being attacked by the Lizardman. This way, the Lizardman army to the east will take over it, and you can prepare, and while their troops are replenishing, you can get ready for an assault with a fresh batch of troops. Go ahead and just put your troops very close to the border. And you should be more than... You can produce a couple more units. Consider doing a mix between spears and clan rats and swordsmen. Having a decent amount of spears in the early game is necessary to fight the Lizardmen because the army to the west and army to the east, the spearmen have like a bit of a bonus against the Lizardmen and especially against their uh, raptor uh, cav units. So do focus on that. They're very important to have. They'll give you the edge you need for doing auto battles and for fighting the battles manually. Bring death disease. With this, uh, since I acquired more spears, it gives me a very biased auto balance. And oh, at this point, I could just auto the battle and win hands down. Suffer minimal casualties, and I essentially have won the eastern front here. Acquire a great amount of food, and everything's good. Do keep in mind, when you occupy town, you can advance the town's tier. But I would strongly suggest you not do this unless you have like you're at a stage, you're like in the mid game, and you have enough food to spare to actually do that. But in all honesty, it doesn't seem even worth it because in general you'll be making a good amount of money with the Skaven. So food is very precious. I would try to keep it in reserve as much as you can. As for the campaign skills for Lord Skrunk, focus on leadership. Put one point into the lead, into the uh, campaign skills, and you'll be focusing later down on the lightning strike, but not not off the bat. There's one bad thing that you don't have replenishment for the Skaven, which is a big deal. So we'll have to get that agent as soon as possible. But for the early game here, you'll put one point into leadership, so you get that extra movement, and then immediately put the rest of your points, early game points, into pestilent breath. You're going to need that because essentially your two best damage dealing units is both your Lord and the Plate Claw Catapult against the Lizardmen. Because the Lizardmen are pretty tough. A good way to think about the Lizardmen is like, think of them as like dwarves. They are very heavily armored and they have very high leadership uh, amounts. So essentially you have, you're going to have to find different ways to actually beat them. Using skirmisher units like Night Runners and stuff are going to be important to have. But in the early game, you're mostly going to be using Clan Rat Spears and uh, Clan Rat Swordsmen. Now eventually, w this is essentially the last stage you're going to be building the uh, what standard infantry. And then you'll be destroying the building and be producing a completely different unit altogether. In this battle, you should you should leave a win, no problem. There will be no reinforcements. But you might be concerned about that army to the west. No, don't worry about it. Sack the settlement so you get a little bit extra cash. You're not going to be developing this region, and it doesn't really matter if it goes into a rebellion. 
Because this region, you'll be focusing on it later. Not at, not initially. This is going to be one of your economic provinces later on. You're getting yourself one extra point into Pestilent Breath, and you'll be utilizing that in the upcoming battle. Because, since the Southern Sentinels have lost their Eastern Front, they're still building up that Western Army. And that will be attacking your capital very soon. So, we gotta get ready for that. And withdraw army as soon as possible back to our capital. Be sure not to go too close to your capital, because you really want the enemy army to actually to approach the capital. Essentially, at around this stage, we'll be making our army go into ambush stance. Ambush stance allow, like, essentially makes our army invisible. This building right here, Lair, is going to be util is a very important building we're going to be utilizing. Now, we're getting both Skirmisher units and the Assassin. The biggest reason we're getting the Assassin er so early is because he gives the he replenishes troops. That's huge. That's a very important ability for the Skaven because you are going to suffer casualties. And since your Lord doesn't have the ability to replenish troops, you need an agent as soon as possible. As predicted, the Sentinels are moving in and they're getting ready. They didn't, they can't, they could attack the capital, but they're staying back a little bit because your army is in close range to it. Now, to convince that Lizardman army to attack your capital, you can move them a little closer and then set your army into ambush stance. This effectively makes your army invisible to the Lizardmen. And Lizardmen just see an easy capital to take over. In your second village, go ahead and just build up economics, buildings, growth, and uh, public order buildings. Since the Lizardmen army does not see the ambush, they should go straight for the capital. Which is perfect for you. The capital is under siege. I very very rarely do the AI attack on the turn they, on the same turn they siege unless they have actual siege equipment like cannons or like dinosaurs with cannons on their back. At this stage, this is where you attack. You might get an ambush or you might just get a standard battle, and you could play the better battle either way. You'll get a, a bit of an advantage if you get an ambush, but. Uh, with the garrison behind your back and your main army, you should have more than enough troops to fight off this army. If you are going to manually play this battle, my biggest uh, tip is to utilize those clan red spears to guard your flanks. Because the AI will do their best to use those that raptor caveats to actually hit you in the back. Or to destroy your artillery piece. Do keep in mind, even though you have a massive army, your two most important units are Lord Skrunk and the Playcock Catapult, because those are your primary DPS weaponry. As you're continuing your the secure your main home province, with that Lizardmen army gone, they only have a small garrison left in the western city. This is your opportunity to take it over. You can make deals with the dwarves and convince them to go to war with the sons, Sentinels, but uh, in all honesty, ever since um, two months ago, when Warhammer 2 was first released, the Creative Assembly has made a patch where essentially the dwarves now hate the Southern Sentinels and they don't join them. It used to be that <laughs> the Lizardmen always convinced the dwarves to fight you, but now it's the completely other way around. So you need to conquer the Lizardmen as fast as you can to secure your home province before the dwarves go to war. More than likely, if this is happening, the reason the dwarves go to war with the Lizardmen is because uh, they lose their world power so quickly because you destroy a stack and a half so quickly that it changes the balance of power. Once the dwarves start going to war with the Lizardmen, the Southern Sentinels, you are essentially have a peaceful time at the moment. You have secured your home province, and now you have you can do anything you want. Normally, it would take a while to get to this stage, but uh, I mean, 
I think I believe Creative Assembly made the Skaven campaign a bit easier. Once you secure your uh, home province, you can focus on getting the assassin as soon as possible, building up your economics, and most important of all, you can secure your first food resource in the region. It'll give you a steady amount of food, but it's not enough to really expand an empire. I would strongly suggest that getting at least two food resource points, two great pastures, so you can at least like stabilize like two armies. Now that we have Pestle and Breath, two points to that, you could go ahead and give yourself another uh, special skill if you want. But at this stage, you want to focus on your ambush success chance. Because every time you go up an army, there's a, there's a certain success, success chance in actually getting ambush. And ambushes are a huge deal for the Skaven. When you start doing like attacks on the dwarves or the dark elves or anything like that, Having the ability to ambush them and then like attack the archers from behind is huge. It's a huge advantage for you and take advantage as much as you, as you can, honestly, because that's how you'll win the campaign. Especially against the dwarves. When I was fighting the dwarves uh, when Warhammer 2 was first released, I kept getting ambushes against them. And I would always go for their ranged units in the back. And then you could deal with all the other melee units using Lord Skronk's Pestilent Breath and the Plate Claw Catapult. At this point, you have a Moments of Peace. You can attack the Lizardman Itza to the north, but it's not suggested. Do not try to go for any ritual sites early game. Though that the game is trying to convince you like there's this big race going on. Of like, oh, you, gotta, you gotta get these uh, shards or warp stones as quickly as possible. I strongly suggest against that because I believe that there's a script that happens that makes all the all the AI in the world hate you for controlling a ritual site for obtaining more warp stone. With legendary difficulty, you'll be taking your time to actually acquire these areas. You'd be also, the primary goal right now, since you've secured your home province, is to secure the southeastern corner of this continent. You'll be securing the plains to your southeast, make that in into an economic zone, and then, as you're leveling up your main faction leader, you'll have to get lightning strike as soon as possible, so you can deal with the high elves that are in the very corner of the continent. Why are we getting lightning strikes so quickly, so soon? The reasoning is, like, even though that, that high elf faction basically doesn't even ever expand, eventually they're going to make a military defending a defense alliance or a military alliance with the Order of the Lord Masters to your west. Once that military alliance is made, eventually you're going to be fighting them. And then you're going to have a fight, fighting a war on two fronts, to the west and the east. If you could destroy the Dusk of Light, High Elves, to the southeast corner as soon as possible, you secure yourself to fight on just one front instead of two. Early game, trying to fight with two well-equipped armies in the early game is just not really practical. It's expensive and you generally don't have the economy to support two advanced armies at such an early stage. This rebellion will always occur. It's the thing about legendary difficulty, but it actually benefits you. You get a little bit of gold, and you get a little bit of food. You can keep your food bar very hot once you secure your main home province and the province to your southeast. Now, and overall, where do you want to see go from here? You'll destroy that rebellion army, and then you're going to bring your main lord and his army to the secondary province. You are exposing your home province to a little bit of danger, and there is a little bit of danger and a risk involved in doing such actions. Generally, the village west of your capital, most of the time it's basically no man's land, back when I played the Skaven. But since things have changed a bit more often, now that the dwarves are fighting the Lizardmen for you, 
You basically have a proxy fighting your wars. And at this stage, you can just like slowly build up your economics and build up your army. To fight the Dusk of the, the High Elves in the corner, you're going to need um, at least three like, uh, catapults. Making a deal with the Vampire Counts here is no problem. You're not going to suffer any penalties to diplomacy with, with the factions. The Lizardmen don't like you and well, that that's never going to really change. Except maybe you, you might get like a uh, a trade or an alliance with different Lizardmen factions across the ocean. But that is basically for a late game, not the early game. You don't need to worry too much about quests or anything like that in the early game or doing the rights. Save as much money as you can for the early game. You can ransom units. You can consume units for better replenishment. Do not do that. Always focus on enslaving units so you can get that bonus uh, to extra food. You'll get a certain amount of food for defeating an army, and you'll get a that two bonus food for cons well enslaving the army. That is the quite honestly the best choice because food is a very limiting factor for the Skaven. And it, it's what really prevents them from like becoming like a super empire. Eventually you'll just have too many villages and then the villages are consuming so much food that it's just not sustainable with so little great pastures around Lustra. I'm guessing they want you to, to attack like different continents to secure the food resources but in general there's just not enough food to go around with the skaven you're essentially ha you're playing like almost like green skins. you have to keep ta attacking so you can have the food to sustain your empire there is an edict that you can issue to generate a little bit more food but it's nowhere near enough to actually supply an empire now why is the second province so important the capital of the second province is on the coastline, and it's a gold mine. You're gonna that gold is what's gonna help you uh, in what help the upkeep in like supporting a secondary army in your arsenal. Eventually, the dwarfs will defeat the lizardmen, and then here's essentially where you have your coin toss. There's a 50-50 chance of what the dwarfs will do next. They are an they are an aggressive faction, so you have to be very careful. There's two there's two things that can happen here. They either declare war on you, or they're they can declare war on the Sentinels of C. I might I might be saying that wrong, but that's how it is. They might either declare war on another Lizardman faction or on you. So it's about a 50-50 chance. Now, if they declare war war on the Sentinels. Then you're in luck. You're you're good. You 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 could secure your secondary province, all the territory, and then build up your economy very early on to support a secondary army or just build up more advanced buildings. But the thing is, with your leader, you need to attack the dwarfs in the in these mountains right here. If you can secure those mountains. You essentially can force the dwarves to fight only on one front instead of attacking your economic villages in the back, in the rear of your empire. Use the village west of your capital as like a front line and just fight the dwarves on that front. Speak, be quick, quick, for the blight in you. For a second I was worried here, like, will this high elf actually attack me? But no. They're generally a very neutral faction and they'll never move out. But uh, they need to be dealt with as soon as possible. My strongest suggestion would be to get Lightning Strike. Get Lightning Strike for your leader. And get three Plague Claw catapults. Once you have three Plague Claws, that's enough firepower to just wipe out half the High Elf army with range. And then you can just sweep the rest of their troops with your Plague Monks, your Clan Rats, and your Speak. leader. Do occasionally check whether or not the Lord Masters have an alliance with them yet. 
for the moment, he just has a trade agreement, but eventually, as the turns progress, they're going to have a defense alliance and a military alliance. You generally want to secure the southeastern part of Lustra as soon as possible before you go to war with the Order of the Lord Masters. Because eventually, the dwarves and the Order of the Lord Masters will be. they'll have an alliance. The reason I put that point in there is just to get a little bit extra money. The other points are really not that worth it. You want the ambush ambush success chance, and you want a little bit of extra money. Because your post loot uh, money is actually pretty good for Skaven. Now, in case you're worried about fighting the dwarves early on, they're not that hard. Initially, I thought the dwarves would be extremely difficult due to the fact that they're they have very heavy armor, but but and they have very high leadership. But in general, they're actually pretty easy to defeat. You just have to t use your lord the best you can. The pestilent breath that Lord Skronk has is extremely powerful. There are battles I could get 400 kills by hitting a good cluster of enemies. All you have to do is really is focus on flanking the lines and then just hit it for hitting the enemy from the side. In this in, in this area I'm essentially building up my defenses for my frontline settlement. Unfortunately it's also holding the food reserves, but I'm also but the, the goal here is to just gain a little bit extra food because I'm repopulating all these villages in this province here. Focus on growth edicts as well for your empire in the early game. The early game is all about growing your villages as, as fast as possible so you can support better buildings, more advanced techs, more advanced buildings. Because every turn that passes, you're not able to research any tech. And that's a little, it's a bit of a con for the Skaven versus like the other factions that can research right off the bat. Having secured three out of four villages, we only need to secure one more, and we'll be done. Now, the thing is, there's a quest of like, oh yeah, the search, the search the ruins and stuff, but honestly, I wouldn't even bother focusing on that. These settlements need to be colonized as soon as possible, so you could then move your army back to the northwest here to fight the dwarves in the mountains and to cause chaos and reinforce your northwestern border as soon as possible. Your southeast border is safe for now. The High Elves will not attack you, but the, they'll not attack you for now until they make a military or defense alliance with the Order of the Lore Masters. Once you've colonized this forest settlement, you have you have two ports, you have food production, and you have a standard village, which you will just focus on growth and public water buildings. This is your money-making area, and you want to try your best to keep it secured. In the late game, it's going to get difficult, but it depends. Here, I was thinking, okay, I'll now that I have everything secured, I'll just build another uh, public water building, or no food production building in my main capital. However, I'm thinking about this and thinking, wait, since I've secured the secondary food province so quickly, I probably don't even need it. I don't need it this early. It's probably better to invest my finances and my money to get the plague claw catapults out as soon as possible. It's, instead of just having one, it'd be better to have two, to buy two more. So you have three plate claws. Then you'll then with your leader, Lord Skronk, you'll invest in like upgrading the uh, the the reload ability with your artillery pieces, and then you have a very powerful unit to destroy enemy armies before they even reach your army. Later in the game, you're going to be building up like warp like three plate claw catapults and two warp lightning cannons. It's a lot of pieces of artillery, but it's the perfect mix in, in doing damage to very thick uh, groups of enemies 
and the two warp lightning cannons are essentially your anti-large uh, artillery pieces to, to snipe enemy generals and to do damage against large units especially the the lizardmen's like triceratops or t-rex units they are a real pain to deal with and your warp lightning cannons can literally snipe them from across the map when you get the engineering agent in your army the engineer the the bonuses he provides to your artillery is crazy like it, it makes your units even more powerful than they already are the bonuses with your leader plus the engineer plus like 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 what faction tech your artillery will be essentially used to beat the campaign and beat any army that goes up against you the only exception to this thing is if you attack the faction north of you Itza, right off the bat if you attack Itza right off the back on legendary difficulty their main capital is like the best of the best there was a time I was like I'm like what we're at turn 17 at the moment at about turn like 20 like 20 or 25 the faction Itza, the lizardman right to the north of you their capital was producing stacks of like a general and like 19 T-Rex units they're just that it, they're on they're literally just that powerful now the good news is they're never gonna bother you I've not I've played I've done a number of tests like over 30 plus campaigns with the Skaven and Itza never attacks you they're generally focused more on their northern front rather than deal with you now does that mean that that you're invisible on the map to the AI no unfortunately I don't think that the Skaven's special ability of being invisible on the map works at all against AI. The AI in general know where you're at. The only way to trick them is by going into ambush stance. And that's quite honestly the only way to actually do this. In general right now, we have full control of two provinces. Your army is stationed in, your, in the Lost Valley, and effectively you'll be building it up here to attack the, the dwarves, the mountains here. Securing this mountain passage will protect your economic province in the rear. So then you can focus all your effort in attacking the dwarves out there. Now, do you want to secure that province that just north of the food production village? It's a if if. Personally, I probably raise it to the ground the uh, the great jungle the southern great jungle province i would raise it to the ground and not expand your empire there yet you're going very deep into enemy lines and you don't want to get caught into a war in the middle of lustra you want to secure the coastline first rather than like push deeper inland because then you might get caught into a war of against course. the other lizard factions the and throne. you're just gonna have issues if you ignore the Dusk of Light, they'll continue to build stacks in this corner. There could be up to like two to four stacks of Dusk Light in that corner, and it's very difficult. But this is why you would essentially invest in getting three Plate Claw catapults and Lightning Strike as soon as possible. With one army, you can secure and beat the High, the high Elves here. And in general, the Hells are not really they're, really... they're really the easiest enemy you'll be fighting as against when you're playing the Skaven. They might have archer units, but you have artillery, so it does their archer advantage doesn't really matter in this regard. You'll get Drillmaster, of course, right after in like, like more... about four or five battles. And then you get Lightning Strike. And then you can decide whether or not you want to go down, continue the campaign skills, or immediately start investing into your leadership tree. There are a number of different skills you can choose from going clan rats, but don't go clan rats because um, your the basic infantry for the Skaven are just not that effective. The Night Runners are okay. They're a skirmish unit, but they're generally not that great of an end game unit. They're a good early game against the uh, Lizardmen, though. Uh, Hellmaster, mm, oh, the Warp Throwers, they're 
actually really useful late game, but I would invest those points much later when you're in the late game, when you have the Death Globe throwers. As for um, as for this, uh, Storm Vermin, don't bother investing any points into this. You, Storm Vermin, for when you're playing Clan Pestilent, you're, you want to invest more into Plague Monks and stuff. Monsters, Hell Pit Abominations, Clan Rat Ogres, uh, no. Not that effective a unit for the for a legendary campaign. However, this one, <laughs> the engineering skill, this is definitely what you want. More ammo and a faster reload speed for your artillery units. Like, think about it. You have an artillery piece which does minus 20 leadership per hit. If you can make it shoot even faster and, and do more leadership damage to the enemy army before it even hits your main army, the battle is already done. And as your artillery levels up, you'll go for this warp smart. And this is almost like, this is literally perfect for a ranged army. Your death globe throwers will get will be more powerful, and your artillery will be more powerful. <laughs> Essentially, in the end, your death globe throwers can destroy an enemy unit before it even reaches you, and that unit is more than likely damaged by your artillery, and they'll just fall fall apart right in front of you before they even reach your plague monks. Yeah, by the very end of the campaign, when you're doing like the finale battles against all the other factions at the vortex, you're gonna have Plague Monks on your front line. Behind the Plague Monks, you'll have Death Globe Throwers. And behind the Death Globe Throwers, you're going to have your artillery pieces. Like for PvE against Legendary AI in the campaign, that is by far the strongest combination I've ever played. And that generally wraps up for the early game start for the Skaven. We'll now go to the campaign that I've beaten and uh, we'll go ahead and go from there. I do have a number of campaigns. I did try one uh, Dark Elf campaign, legendary campaign. I'm already winning by like the first try. Probably the easiest campaign, but let's go ahead and load up the end game Skaven campaign. Welcome to turn 253, where the Skaven have conquered and beaten the Vortex campaign, and right now it's just a, what, a battle of survival at the moment. The situation looks a little bad, but honestly this was the perfect situation because uh, the reason I'm in so much debt is because my economic province got destroyed by the Vortex armies, and I basically lost half my empire. The, dark, the Cult of Pleasure will always be a superpower, and they're always coming down from the north, and they'll be destroying everything on the way. Now, the reasoning I didn't bother trying to hold the front line, because I can. The, the Cult of Pleasure is not really that difficult. What's difficult is fighting the Vortex armies constantly and protecting your economic villages, and you got to protect the, the ritual sites and stuff. So essentially, you need about three very well-equipped armies to protect your interests. And with the Skaven, you could generally support about three well-equipped armies. Like, you can build, like, trash uh, stacks, but don't expect to, like, to conquer something and hold it well. As I, I controlled almost all of Lustria, like, all up to this border up here, all of that was under my control. But... With the Vortex armies spawning in, I basically made all I had to pull back all my troops on the Eastern Front, Middle Front, and the Western Front to basically protect my capital and protect the ritual sites. The uh, island of down there was one of the uh, ritual sites. The be the uh, the bearded skulls here was another ritual site, and my capital. Use. Have your main army defend the capital. Use your best army to defend the capital, and then with the capital's garrison, plus your main army, you should be able to auto every intervention army, no problem. What you're seeing right here is kind of like my setup overall. This is my primary army that I was utilizing in the final battle 
at the vortex. Three Blake Claw catapults, two Warp Lightning Cannons, and this combination alone was destroying many armies. The two Doom Wheels was just for fun. I could have invested into anything else, but I thought, eh, I'll try I'll try buy the most expensive unit because I was able to afford it. I have three Death Globe Throwers because uh, essentially they are an amazingly powerful unit for when it comes to close range uh, throwing. Uh, close range, they have about skirmisher range, but their the damage of their missile weapons is extremely powerful. And the plank bunk, uh, plank monks are essentially my front line. And with an army like this, you have no chance of losing. This is more closer to like a of what my standard army would look like in about the mid game. Just might just take away the death globe throwers and replace them with night runners. I would have like replace no, no, replace the death globe throwers with plague monks. Keep the night runners and have two warp lightning cannons and three plague claws. And that's generally what I would have as a mid game army against uh, a number of factions. The night runners are a decent mid game slash early game unit. Just because they're really good at capture, like killing skirmisher units, and they are a skirmisher unit themselves. As for your uh, agent, this is uh, my engineer, and where I invested the majority of my points into making the artillery as powerful as it can be. You have to really utilize the Skaven's uh, what, special units, and their special, their best special unit by far is the play claw. While it's not that effective against large units like giants or flying eagles or like large units in general, but against normal units this is a perfect weapon to utilize. Your warp lighting cannons are going to be used to fight the large units, and with your engineer, you can make the you, you, your artillery's range even further and do more damage and reload faster. Like, your reload skill is going to be almost like plus 50% from normal, so you're basically like firing a machine gun's worth of da of like stuff at the enemy. And with extra ammunition, you can fire all day and destroy the army before it even arrives at your doorstep. At this stage of the campaign, though, you're probably wondering, is there any reason to continue? And no. At the, for legendary difficulty, the best thing that to end with is a on a a vortex victory like this trying to fight the uh the cult of pleasure and legendary difficulty is a pain i mean it could be done i could beat them but the problem is the more you expand your empire with the skaven the more difficult it is is to maintain the food control because lustra only has three great pastures and it's nowhere near enough to supply your armies and all the all this territory right here. Now the thing is, some people would ask, why did I expand my empire so far north into Lustra? And the thing is, what I was effectively doing is was creating a meat shield, letting because you don't want to fight vortex armies, the chaos and the the vortex armies and the standard armies you don't want to fight them all at once you want to generate as much money as possible so you can then just like spam a bunch of elite units to protect your critical cities that's why i just disbanded that army right there that was just a army for just a couple turns to fight the vortex armies once the vortex armies are, are destroyed then you have peace you can then just fight fight the cult of pleasure. But at this point, you it's best to just secure the victory and just go along with it. Now, I was thinking, maybe I have to focus on attacking like certain provinces around the world and like securing food resources, but I, I just don't think like the Creative Assembly planned for for the Skaven to attack like uh, go for critical food supply locations. Secure these th your three ritual sites, have your three armies defend there, and you're good. I'm just clicking here to show you guys off the, the building specs, the food production, 
the uh, the Death Globe Thrower production buildings, the uh, the Plague Monk building. Plague Monk buildings are actually really good to build, by the way, because of the fact that they uh, they help con like maintain control of the settlement and by exp and like spreading uh, more uh, scaven corruption. However, oh, I I I do have to bring this up. Unlike other factions where corruption where benefits you greatly, Skaven corruption in this game hurts you. Well, it, it, there's a there's a pro and a con. The pro is you'll gain more um, abilities to actually like summon more troops from the underground. The con is it does public order damage to you. So that's why you have untainted and a, a balance between untainted and corruption when you're like building up your empire. If you don't want to deal with uh, public order penalties, choose untainted uh, uh, buildings. And that will help maintain control and lower the public order issues. As for a reminder, when you're attacking these ritual sites, do not secure this coastal ritual site as much as you can. The altar of the horned rat. Unless you have an, a stack that you can station in that area to secure your eastern front. Because this is what happens. The AI in general are going to go after you. Even AI across, the, like across other continents are going to come and try to secure this ritual site if you take it. If the AI, if a different AI takes it, they don't care. The cult of pleasure will go out of its way to secure that ritual site as much as they can. For some reason, they don't care about the ritual site to the west, but if you secure Lustria's eastern ritual site and the one to the far north, if you secure those two ritual sites, the cult of pleasure will be attacking you nonstop. But if you have the manpower, if you have the resources to actually hold those two, then that's fine. But in general, let the AI beat you to the Vortex. Don't try to race with the legendary AI in beating them to the Vortex victory because, in all honesty, you won't win. The AI, like at legendary difficulty, the AI is cheating so much that they'll essentially be ahead of you. And that sums up my legendary starter guide for this game. I do hope you guys enjoyed the video, and if you have any questions regarding the Skaven campaigns, are you looking forward to a different campaign starter, legendary starter guide? Feel free to put it in, in the comments below of which one you want to see next, and I'll be focusing on that campaign next. So, I'll see you guys later.